It is a Thursday, the 14th day of December 2017. Hello there and welcome to News Tonight. John Anopori will be joining me shortly on the same language desk. I am Edward Rukidi Kijanangoma. Let's get started straight away. President Rory Seveni has assured head teachers that the salaries of science teachers are to be increased with immediate effect, while the remuneration of head teachers and their deputies would be slightly higher than what science teachers will get. The president was last evening speaking at the closing of a two-day secondary school's head teachers retreat at State House in Tebe. Mr. Seven said in the coming years, salaries of arts teachers would also be increased. We have more in this report. Your Excellency, on behalf of all these head teachers, we thank you very much for sparing your time to come and be with us this evening. 3,000 head teachers from both private and government aided secondary schools throughout the country attended the first ever national retreat that was organized by the Minister of Education and Sports under the theme The Head Teacher as the First Inspector. The retreat aimed at engaging all secondary school head teachers to reflect on the importance of their role of ensuring that standards are upheld in the delivery of an effective and efficient quality education in Uganda. And then the, somebody says, these are all head teachers. <laughs> they are head teachers of what? <laughs> they are head teachers of secondary schools. <laughs> Government and private. Then I say, oh, okay, I'm seven, are they all? <laughs> President Museven also informed the retreat that discussions are being held with top management of the Ministry of Education and Sports to reduce the number of subjects taken by students in secondary schools. The president again called upon head teachers from government-aided schools to stop charging fees in universal education institutions where education is meant to be free for children of parents who cannot afford school fees. But for you to say all of you must, must bring this money. If you don't bring money for this, for that, for that, the children should be expelled from school. That one is very, very bad. And I have not been happy. But for me, I always go slowly. I, I complain. I know that God is there listening. <laughs> I'm very, I'm very worried about you. <laughs> so you go back and get an honest answer to, this, to, do, to these two questions. Can the families afford or are they pretending that they can? They can? Don't answer now. You go back and... <laughs> Mr. Mseveni also called upon planners in the Ministry of Education and Sports consult him before building new school structures, adding that they should consider building simple bungalow school structures compared to the expensive storage buildings that take a lot of money and lead to hindrances of building new secondary schools in other sub-counties. First of all, you don't listen to some of us, the political leaders whom God has, because the, 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 this type of, uh, of, in, of insubordination is not, is not good for the country. Because somebody should have come back to me and said, but you, you are talking about this, but you know, for us we have analyzed and we have found advantages in this and that and that and that, then we would have moved together. But now, I am a, a, a bitter man, but because I am a Christian, <laughs> I have forgiven all those that... Uh... He urged head teachers to emphasize patriotism in schools so that they can promote students' love for Uganda, Africa, and for themselves. 
The Minister of Education and Sports, Honorable Janet Kataham Seveni, urged the head teachers to always pray to God whenever they are executing their duties. My enforcer always is God. And so I thought that a teacher truly needs an enforcer. And since the enforcer I know who is the best is God, I want to advise you that all of you learn to pray. Mrs. M7 also called upon head teachers to create a school environment that is not only limited to classroom or academic work, but also one that encourages students to succeed and beautify whenever they live. The teaching must be not just for the head alone, but also for the heart and the hands. The Permanent Secretary of Ministry of Education and Sports, Mr. Alex Kakoza, commended Mrs. M7 for working effortlessly to improve the quality of education in Uganda right after her appointment. The President presented awards of appreciation to some outstanding head teachers in the country who included Mr. Mhumza George of Chamate Secondary School, Mrs. Rose Izizinga of Chitante, Mr. Joseph Ojok of St. Joseph's College, Laibi, and Mr. Nick Godfrey of Pade Girls, among others. I'm Dennis Blair Kalanzi in State House TV. And we do believe that the teachers must all be smiles after that meeting there. Now from the education sector, let's shift our attention to the health sector where hundreds of Ugandans continue to flock Uganda Broadcasting Corporation grounds for free medical checkups. Now the camp organized by the National Broadcaster and some health providers has seen many receive yellow fever vaccination, hepatitis B, sickle cell testing and HIV and had complications among others. Banajiga reports. The Uganda Broadcasting Corporation Health Camp has entered day four at Uganda Broadcasting Corporation grounds and continues to attract a huge turn up. The camp has also been supported by Uganda Heart Institute and Uganda National Medical Stores that have come on board to offer free yellow fever vaccination and free heart checkup, respectively. Brenda Tuaide aged 30 years is among hundreds of people that flocked UBC grounds for services, this time seeking help of about 23 million for heart surgery in India. The Masana full resident and the mother of four at Haire says since 2005 when she was diagnosed with a heart surgery she has been trying to raise the money for treatment. She says doctors recommended that she gets operated this year to avoid what may happen in future. Dr. Najemba from Uganda Heart Institute advises on how to prevent heart diseases. We also call upon uh, the public to look into uh, what we call a healthy lifestyle behaviors like uh, our diet, alcohol and smoking, which is a big problem currently, and then also ensuring that we are uh, doing our routine checks basically. Musoga, a nutritionist, says eating behaviors, especially among the aged, is the root cause of heart complications. Physical exercise help in control of blood pressure and other heart conditions. Of course somebody is obese, of course that means they will have limited physical exercise, limited mobility and in the process they develop heart conditions. 
these are optimistic that by the end of this camp, many would have benefited. We have observed a big turn up in the number of our patients, mm. and uh, we've managed at least to harvest some uh, good cases of patients who are going to benefit from uh, our uh, coming here. <laughs> Other services in the camp include testing and giving vaccines like hepatitis B, yellow fever, cervical cancer, sickle cells, eye care services, HIV testing and counseling, and blood donation. Bernard Iga, UBC. Good initiative there by the National Broadcast. And of course, uh, those of you who have not yet come to the camp, to the health camp, you can take advantage of the remaining day, and that is tomorrow, to come and be tested. You never know. You could be walking with an ailment that you don't know. Let's move on now, and we go to Western Uganda, particularly to Mbarara District, where President uh, Yorim Seveni has commended Ntare school alumni for promoting a government policy on sports. The president noted that government is committed to supporting sports, both in school and the community. He said sport is part of the criteria government uses to select and admit students to government universities on sponsorship. The president made the remarks in a speech read for him by the Prime Minister, Dr. Hakan Gunda, during a fundraising dinner and launch of a drive to support sports in Ntari School. The function was held at Sheraton Hotel Kampala. Ntari School was fundraising for funds to build a sports complex estimated to cost 1.6 billion Ugandan shillings. 21.85 million shillings. Entire school old boys have raised 221 million shillings during their inaugural fundraising dinner for construction of a 1.6 billion shillings sports complex. I therefore call upon all students of different schools, especially the ones that have not uh, thought about rehabilitation and supporting of their schools to learn from Ontario School Old Boys Association. <laughs> President Yoweri Museveni, who is also an old student of the school and the patron of Ontario School Old Boys Association, contributed 50 million shillings to the cause during the event held at Sheraton Hotel, Kampala. President Yoweri Museveni has uh, played or is going to make a contribution of 50 million shillings to this country. The sports complex is part of a 10-year master plan that will cost at least 54 billion shillings. We are supporting our laboratory infrastructure and I think this year alone uh, they, they are providing the that laboratory infrastructure is going to cost 2.5 billion and the government is committed to working on that infrastructure. But the whole master plan, as you saw it, is going to cost us 54 billion. Also, we are here to explore ways to raise funds for the sports complex, as has been shown to you. After completion, the complex will have a pavilion, changing rooms, washrooms, an Olympic-sized swimming pool, tennis, basketball, and netball courts. The school boasts of highly placed old students, including Uganda's President Yoweri Museveni, Rwanda's President Paul Kagame, ministers and academicians. Some of the outstanding old students were recognized at the fundraising dinner. For the computers for the school, because we are thinking that this might be, it's, it's going to be. Samuel Grandi, UBC News. Now, the justice, a law and order sector stakeholders have met to deliberate on the ongoing process that's aimed at harmonizing sentencing guidelines for magistrate courts. According to the principal judge, Yorokam Bamwine, with the document in place, magistrate courts will no longer have reasons to go overboard in as far as determining sentences is concerned. We have more on that in this report. I used to say, ah, there is lack of repentance, the person doesn't show remorsefulness. In a bid to harmonize sentencing guidelines, key stakeholders have shared views on how to come up with an accommodative document for improved service delivery in the judicial system. 
presiding over the meeting in which stakeholders were perusing through the draft document, the principal judge, Yorkamba Mwine, emphasized the importance for the magistrate courts to have uniform procedure in determining sentences. Such that a magistrate in Karamoja, when sentencing an offender, will take into account what a magistrate in Kisoro is doing with regard to an offence committed there. And when you do that, you, we expect, if people follow the, the, the guidelines, we expect not similar sentences, but comparable sentences in like offences. The Director of Public Prosecutions, Dr. Mike Chibita, dismissed fears that the guidelines may affect the discretion of a presiding magistrate. This does not take away the discretion of the judicial officers, but it is a way of guiding them so that they operate within certain parameters. Some of the issues already agreed upon include the award of a custodial sentence as a last resort, especially where the purpose of the sentence cannot be achieved by a sentence other than imprisonment, though the prosecution bench find it tricky. And for the community, actually, I was told that, uh, that in sentencing, custody is to sentences as an injection, is to treatment that most local people, unless you inject them, they don't think you have treated them. For us also, uh, representing the society, unless somebody is put in, we don't feel like they have been punished amply. But anyway, the guidelines are telling us that uh, custody should be last resort. However, members are still in disagreement on the issue of awarding compensations to victims of wrongful prosecution. He was on death row for 11 years. And he was asking, so how can you pay me back my 11 years? And of course you could never. So when you say that somebody who is wrongfully prosecuted, I think we might extend that to somebody wrongfully convicted or something. It is a Pandora's box. I would rather we left it for now. But consider it. Is it the time to consider compensating a victim at this stage? Not the victim. Yeah, he's a victim. <laughs> Rightly so. Yeah, the DPP, the fellow is a victim. The principal judge, Yorkam Bamwine, advised the Law Reform Committee to critically appreciate some laws. The process that has been ongoing for the last one year is expected to end mid-2018, though the principal judge insists there is no time frame for such a project. It is a very uh, uh, complex process. It's what organizes most judicial officers. So when it comes to uh, giving them guidance, you really have to take your time. It's not something that one can rush and get right. In the draft document, it is highlighted that court can only depart from the sentencing guidelines with clear reasons. However, this is still a draft that can be subjected to changes. Doka Skimon and Gloria Guitavinji, UBC News. Thanks, Dokas and uh, Greater Vinji, for that report there. Now, the Minister for, Indi for Information and Communication Technology, Frank Tumwebaze, has blasted district information officers for inadequate knowledge about social media. Interfacing with information officers here in Kampala, the Minister learnt with shock that most of the information officers are not on Twitter or Facebook. The Minister had beckoned district information officers to improve and empower them on how to perform their work better. District information officers are responsible for analyzing and dissemination of government information at the district level. However, it was a shock for the Minister for Information, Communication and National Guidance, Frank Tumwebazi, to learn that the changing trends of information and communication dissemination, like social media, has left many information officers behind. Because the people you are targeting, the young people, how can you be a CDO of a district and you are not on social media? CDOs target young people. Are they not the ones in charge of youth livelihood programs? All the youth of this country, even the illiterate youth in the villages who do this bricklaying and all that, are on social, are on Facebook, if you didn't know. So where will you find them? 
So digital skilling. Tumwebaze has pledged to equip the information officers with skills and modern tools of work. Now, discuss what you need. We shall give you digital skills, okay? We shall push for the institutionalization and formalization and elevation of the office of a DIO at the district to head the department. Yes, to head the department. And uh, what digital gadgets do you need? You get it? If you have a department, some of those things you can budget for them. But if I give you a computer and you are not on Twitter, District information officers on their side have accused the Ministry of Information and Communications Technology for neglect and inadequate funding. The information officers say such neglect have posed huge challenges that have almost rendered them irrelevant. The information officers raised the concerns while meeting the officials from the Ministry at Office of the Prime Minister in Kampala. These things remain in figures. They just remain in the budget. You ask for money, they'll tell you there's no money. The car will tell you about councillors' allowance and so many other things. I think the only way for us to get out of this difficult situation is if, if the ministry could help us and we get some grants for communication and information dissemination. Is one, the relevance of information officers in light of the underfunding, and two, career growth. You cannot be information officer for over 10 years or even 20 years and you retire and you're still information officer. We are not more desk, top desk officers. Our work requires that you go to the field, something like that. We also want you to include in the list of those priorities for next financial year during the planning process that please provide us with transport. It will be so helpful to, to us. The commissioner. Information dissemination, Moses Watasa, says the meet is to chat ways to see how to help the officers to do their work better. We have decided to call these people here today to talk to them uh, because we want to understand their challenges in order for us as a parent ministry to support them to function better. Onyango Jackson and Philip Aguta reporting in Kampala. Now, higher institutions of learning have been advised to impart quality and relevant education to learners in order to compete favorably on the international uh, job market. Now, this was uh, said by Professor James Mulisa, who was presiding over uh, Chiambogo University's 14th graduation ceremony at the university premises. We we'll have more on that in this report. <laughs> Over 7,000 graduates have been awarded with degrees and diplomas and the certificates in education, agriculture, among other disciplines of Chambogo University. Presiding over the event, Professor James Melissa has advised proprietors of higher learning institutions to ensure provision of quality and relevant education. Chambogo University being the superintendent of the teacher training in this country, but where is the quality? And since Chambogo University is the one responsible for superintending over the training of the teachers, let us look at the quality of the teachers that come out as trained teachers in this country. Molisa also emphasized the need for such institutions to embrace the vocational education system, which provides hands-on skills to the students to enable them to start their own jobs than searching for them. We've got a full cycle now as a country because the first people that brought formal education in this country focused on skills. But as time went on, that was put in the back background. Today, we are talking about skilling Uganda. So we've come around to realize that we can't ignore skills. I would like to see that Chambogo University, as it was in the past, remains the epicenter of skills, skills in education. Some of the graduates say they are to apply for international jobs because they have acquired enough skills for them to excel in all endeavors. But then I have to mention the respect 
But me, I think it's a good thing to create. Yeah, we provide in our own way. If it's using our computer, we find ways of how am I going to use my computer in my they have been advised to take on any jobs that come their way, especially in hard to reach areas. Deborah Namamonde and Shafiga Nalubanga compiled the report. And still on the education sector, higher institutions of learning have been. Um, uh, Sorry, I beg your pardon. Uh, Macquarie University Main Gate, which has taken six uh, months, to, uh, months of reconstruction, has been officially opened. Now, while opening uh, the gate, Macquarie University uh, Chairman Council Engineer Dr. Charles Wana Etienne expressed the gratitude to the Kampala Capital City Authority and the World Bank for this project, as it is to beautify the face of the institution internationally. The 6.9 billion shillings compensation project in terms of road construction works within the university follows a memorandum of understanding signed on June the 21st between both parties after the former had encroached on the latter's 2.468 acres of land during the ongoing Makerere Hill Road construction. facilitate <laughs> smooth and orderly entrance and exit university. So the general public shall be expected to follow the procedures that have been set in place. Uh, the pedestrians will also be expected to follow procedures put in place. The main uh, vehicular entrance and exit will be manned automatically by this system for which some payment will be required. Uh, but the pedestrian access will remain open 24 hours for members of the public to come in and get out of the campus. We have provided access for disability, and provision for disability, so that persons with disability can uh, come in uh, without any difficulty. You'll also see if you walk around campus, you'll see that our walkways are finished in such a way that if you have, for instance, a chair, uh, you can just roll across. That is to make sure that persons with disability, but also maybe people who want to ride bicycles can do that. Bicycles will be allowed to ride, but motorcycles or border border will not be allowed. The big contribution. And this gate has come because of the cooperation between Makere and KCCA, where Makere gave KCCA land to expand uh, for the road, and KCCA in turn uh, provided resources through the World Bank to do this gate for us. To Igara now, where Igara East residents are electing their member of parliament in a by election caused by cancellation of the February uh, 2016 elections in which court cancelled Marshall Andrews' victory. Now, voting started as early as 7 a.m. with a slight turn-up of voters, although it later improved, as we hear in this report. Igara East residents are electing their member of parliament in a by-election caused by a cancellation of Feb 2016 elections in which court cancelled Marshall Andrews' victory. Voting started as early as 7 a.m. with a slight turn-up of voters, though it later improved. Voting has been ongoing smoothly following a directive from the Electoral Commission chairperson, Simon Mugenyi and his staff. During and after polls, some voters were seen camping at the polling station in the name of guarding their votes. By press time, the exercise was declared peaceful without any causes of malpractice. At, the, at this hour of three, we have moved a big step and everything is okay at the polling station. Our reporter visited various polling stations, including Nyabutobo Primary School, Ruetuha Primary School, Keijoba Primary School, among others, confirming a peaceful exercise. Commission's representative Stephen Tashobia emphasized free and fair elections. <laughs>
ukweza umutsinzi bitari umuntu umuntu ubwo nashatse bakabura kuko Results from polls are to be announced later in the main tallying center, Bushenyi District Council Hall. Susan Naonga and Collins reporting. News tonight will take a short break, but we've got a lot more lined up for you. Do stay with us. Welcome back from that short break, and this is News Tonight here on UBC TV. The current Ministry of Health statistics indicate increased rate of children uh, being born with sickle cell disease. Now, the ministry is now encouraging premarital testing and counselling and screening of newborn babies. Sickle cell is a genetic disease where the red blood cells are not in their normal shape, thus making the manufacture and movement of blood to different parts of the body difficult. Like the sickle, the sickler, like the sickle, the one we use to slash, instead of being oval. And that's why they, it's difficult for, for them to move smoothly in the blood vessels. So the, the, blood, the, the red blood cells are abnormal. They stick in the blood vessel, they also die very fast. And that's why the patients will have anemia, will have pain, will have complications. Because if, for example, the, the bones are not supplied with oxygen, the bone, that bone part will die. They can even have stroke because if they broke the, 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 the vessels going to the, to the brain and it's part of the brain dies, you can also have stroke. So it's a bad disease. According to the Uganda National Sickle Cell Survey of 2015, 13.3% of the population have sickle cell traits, 0.73% have the disease, while 15,000 children are born with sickle cell annually. Usually sickle cell symptoms start presenting around six months. That's when children start presenting symptoms of sickle cell, even when they are sicklers. But if you identify them before, early, before they start get, getting into crisis, and you start managing them, their they are chances of survival and their quality of life improves. Sickle cell disease can only be transferred to the child if all the parents are carriers of sickle cell traits. However, if one of the parents is a carrier of the sickle cell trait and the other is not, they will bear children without the disease. This is the reason why the Ministry of Health is encouraging premarital testing and counseling. Sensitize people to test for sickle cell as part of, you know, the critical uh, assessments they have to do in making that very fundamental decision on who to marry. So not only HIV, but sickle cell. We have seen from the report, from the remarks from the, from the guest here and the guest of honor, that sickle cell kills more children than HIV, than all these other diseases like Ebola and whatever, which people quake so much about. It is silent, but it kills steadily. So we must make sure we don't propagate it. And the best way to do is during, a past, during the, 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 the time when you are making a choice for parenting, you should always make a conscious, a conscious a decision based on knowledge so that you don't propagate that gene. Due to the high burden of the sickle cell disease, different organizations and companies are joining the fight with the latest being certified public accountants who have contributed 15,000 sickle cell testing kits worth 30 million shillings to the Ministry of Health. Thank you very much, Adiana Kuti, UBC. Thanks, Adia, for that report there. Tomorrow District Now, where the founder and financier of the Nording Syndrome Treatment Center in Omoro District is withdrawing support to the Institute by the end of December this year. Now, this has heightened concern among the leadership in Omoro District who have raised immediate need for the central government to take over. However, in response, a State Minister for Northern Uganda Rehabilitation, Grace Freedom Kuyuchini, appeals for a phased withdrawal of the support to enable smooth transition. Onyango Jackson reports. A few months ago, it was difficult to imagine these victims of the Nodding Disease Syndrome would once again stand on their feet to be of help to themselves and the country. But today, there is much hope never than before, 
exhibited by the ability by the victims to comprehend. Hope for Humans, a non-government organization with a center in Omoro, Wang Wong, Lobo Village, in Odex Subcounty, has been instrumental in rehabilitating and transforming the lives of the victims. However, the future is bleak for a total of 29 other children under care of the center. The founder and financial of the center, Susan Gazada, is withdrawing support to place where some have over time obtained vocational skills. Although more local government officials applaud the central government for supporting the center with food through the time, they appeal for takeover of the center. The district also wants transfer of the budgetary location for the center from Gulu to Amoro, the host of the center. Most of these victims come from other districts, which even get actually money more than Amoro. So we are requesting that if the government can relocate more funds and improve on the time that we receive these funds, this would help us in running the center. The money that comes to Gulu district must come to Omoro district, not Gulu district, because the, the, the victims are not in Gulu, they are in Omoro. That is what I'll take back to Minister of Health, to Office of the Prime Minister, that it should be corrected. That money should be given to Omoro district so that Omoro district can support this situation. State Minister for Northern Uganda Rehabilitation, Grace Freedom Kuichwin, visited the center and appealed for phased withdrawal to enable smooth transition. And I have got a plan and budget from the district which I'm going to take to the Prime Minister, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Agriculture, so that they see what is required here and how they can support. But also as a development worker, I would have loved to have seen a gradual plan of pulling, pulling out. Susan will still be, if she cannot support 100%, what can she support? Kuchwin pledged to advocate for the development of the institute into a health center and hospital in fulfillment of the aspiration of the community. Onyango Jackson, reporting for UBC TV, Inomoro. And of course, it would be dangerous if that institute is actually closed once uh, the support to it is withdrawn. Uh, still uh, on information, uh, sorry, on news pertaining to the health sector. Information reaching UBC TV is that the sick state minister for primary health care, uh, Joyce Moriku, is steadily improving from her sick bed at Aga Khan Hospital in Nairobi, Kenya, according to state minister of uh, State Minister for General Duties, Sarah Opendi. The minister can now make phone calls and talk, which was not the case last week. Now, Moriko was airlifted to Nairobi after her health started deteriorating, deteriorating drastically after suspected poisoning uh, last month. Honorable Joyce Kaduchu is uh, progressing well. As of this morning, I received information from Aga Khan Hospital there was very good progress, uh, she, although she's still in that state, but at least she could now open her eyes and communicate with the people around her. So we keep praying for her and uh, to fully recover and get back. Minister Sarah Opendi, there, of course, talking about uh, uh, Minister Joyce Moriko, who is steadily improving at Aga Khan Hospital in Nairobi, and of course we wish her a quick recovery. Now, Mengo Hospital has refuted media reports that most, if not all, patients that underwent neurosurgery operations at a medical camp in October this year lost their lives. According to Dr. Rose Mutumba, the medical director of Mengo Hospital, out of the 33 complex neurosurgeries, 28 were successful. Now, this means only five died, contrary to media reports of over 30, as we hear in this report. 
In October this year, Mengo Hospital partnered with Duke University to provide complex neurosurgeries at subsidized rates. The partnership signaled a bright future of neurosurgery in Uganda with equipment worth 1 million US dollars training and research at Mengo Hospital. But the recent media reports indicated that the surgeries were performed by interns in crowded rooms and only ended into death. The hospital administration has dismissed these reports as false. Um, if we asked, did we follow the regulations? Yes, we did. Were the specialists that came in licensed? Yes, they were. Were they interns? No, they were not. This the, did we pile people in the theater? No. According to Dr. Rosi Mutumba, the medical director of Mengo Hospital, out of the 33 complex neurosurgeries, 28 were successful. In our opinion, we had a very successful camp in October. Um, and we are building a neurosurgical unit in this hospital. The vision of Mengo Hospital is to become a center of excellence. So we are not going to be diverted from that mission. This neurosurgical program is part of that. The Duke University neurosurgery team, led by Professor Michael Hagland, has been performing similar surgeries in Uganda for the last 10 years and training medical professionals. Welcome back. Let's have a look at business news now. And in a bid to rid the country of plastic waste, the plastic recycling industry, a subsidiary of Coca-Cola Africa, is rolling out a mass plastic collection and recycling campaign in the country, uh, starting with the five divisions of Kampala. The plant, which currently recycles close to 300 tons of plastic daily, plans to partner with numerous organizations to collect and recycle more plastic across the country. Now, Coca-Cola Africa Communications Director Simon Kahero says by doing this, they will be creating jobs for many and conserving the environment. It is estimated that close to 700 tons of plastics is disposed in Uganda daily, with urban centers accounting for the vast chunk of this waste. In Kampala city alone, 28 tons of garbage is generated monthly and only 500 tons is collected. The uncollected and poorly disposed trash including plastics ends up clogging the sewage systems and this comes with associated effects on the environment. Plastic Recycling Industries Uganda, a subsidiary of Coca-Cola Africa, is however turning this plastic waste into treasure and the results are there for all to see. The plastic waste is gathered from all collection centers spread across the country and later transported to the main recycling center in Kampala. Here, the plastics are weighed, sorted, cleaned and later recycled into export material used in the making of various products. Coca-Cola plans to roll out this initiative across the country and numerous partnerships have been entered. We are, we are going to be exp expanding the partnership to include the Buganda Kingdom, which has a very, very serious Bulunji 1C program, and they already are running the Ndeba Collection Centre in partnership with us. KCC also provides uh, the trucks and skips at different points. And we are looking at increasing the number of skips specifically for plastics. One of the things that we want to change in Uganda is for people not to throw plastic garbage together with organic waste. If we learn to separate this garbage, then we will turn this into money much, much quicker. Then we have another partnership with the Masaka Collection Center. So the Masaka Collection Center will be bringing in plastics from Masaka and southwestern Uganda. And we are looking at increasing the partnerships countrywide to go to eastern Uganda, northern Uganda, so that we get all the plastic waste in this country brought to this facility and other plants we may open and recycled. The Director of Public Affairs and Communications at Coca-Cola Africa, Simon Kaheru, says this has turned out to be a source of income to many. Kaheru was taking the Executive Director Uganda Exports Promotions Board, Eri Tunayo Kamjisha, around Coca-Cola's plastic recycling plant in Nakawa. Yeah. 
Kamjisha promised to work with Coca-Cola in accessing markets and better equipment needed in this trade. So the fact that Coca-Cola is creating jobs for those people using uh, plastic collection and recycling is very, very important for Uganda. But also the other fact is that Coca-Cola is exporting. We are going, getting foreign exchange. As Uganda Export Promotion Board, we support that endeavor and we hope that we can have a discussion, we can have a conversation with the government on the, on the, 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 the need for having uh, this machine into this country because this is important for production and productivity. And if we are going to increase exports, we need to increase production and productivity. Innocent Obong, the plant manager, plastic recycling industry Uganda, says with the extruder in place, they will be able to add value on the recycled product. Uh, we are exploring a uh, uh, possibility of improving our investment or our technology to be able to further produce this finished product or these flakes into other products. We would, would like to, we are exploring investing in extruder where we can convert this plastic into lumber from which you can make benches, you can make chairs, you can make beds, and this could, uh, could be part of our corporate responsibility to, to support some schools, to support some hospitals. So that's where we, we are looking. A new study revealed that a million plastic bottles are bought around the world every mint, and this number is expected to increase by 20% in 2021. And without efforts of proper disposal of plastics and recycling in place, the impact this will have on the environment is grave. Samuel Senono. UBC News. UBC Sport and we begin with football. And Uganda will have to go uh, past Zanzibar in the semi-final of the 14th edition of the Sekafa Senior Challenge Cup uh, that's currently ongoing in Kenya. Now the Cranes technical team is optimistic that Uganda will cling to the 15th edition of the championship. Our Yvonne Chinayanji extra time goal saw Kenya cruise to the final after having a barren 90 minutes encounter against Burundi. Kenya finished top of Group A with 8 points, thus qualifying for the semi finals. Meanwhile, defending champion Uganda Cranes will square ties against Zanzibar on Friday in the second semi final match in the Sakafa Senior Challenge Tournament. <laughs> The two sides have faced each other 14 times in all competitions with Uganda, winning massive 12 times, drawing once, and a loss. The Cranes secured a place in the semi-finals, having topped Group B with five points. The game is scheduled to be played at Machako Stadium, with Uganda being tournament favorite. Elsewhere in the Kosafa under-20 competitions, South Africa beat Egypt 1-0 to qualify for the junior championship final. And in the Ugandan game, the Hippos lost 6-5 to Lesotho after a growing game. Uganda lost at the knockout stage after a penalty shutout and holding Lesotho almost beyond the South Africans' limit. They now lose an opportunity to go for finals. <laughs> For UBC, Helen Barbara, Juzamba. Of course, we wish Uganda Cranes uh, the best uh, in the finals. They have to qualify for the finals in Sekafa. And of course, third play for the Kosafa uh, team that is uh, sort of, you know, representing Uganda, and that is the Hippos. We also wish them the best much as they have not been able to qualify for the finals. Now the National Futsal Super League resumes tonight with teams with, uh, with, with teams hoping to wind up the year with better ranking on the league table. Now Dream is paired with Yap Stas, uh, but James play Typhoons, uh, KSPG tassel it out with Sona. Riham play Parakits while Elephants battle out Yik Kavoa. Uh, KCPG lead the league table with 15 points. A dream in second with 12, while Park lies in third place with 10 points. Yapstars Ali Mukibi and Sona's Veron Bikamata both hit the scoring sheet with 10 goals each, with Suleiman Mutiama in third place with 8 goals. Now, all games are to be played at the international futsal grounds in Mango.
And finally, basketball and it's sad news because Uganda Basketball League champion City Oilers uh, suffered a third defeat against Angola's Inter Club of 49-67 in the ongoing Zone 5 Afro Basketball Champions Cup in the city of Rade, Tunisia. Now the Zone 5 representatives Oilers saw Oilers lead in the first quarter 2016 while Inter Club stepped up their defense in the remaining quarters uh, through point guard Gerson Domingos, who was outstanding in defense for the Angolan club. Jimmy Enabu, Stanley Ochiti, Jordan Mays and Darius Piguis and Stephen Omonyi, among others, delivered results for their next encounters in the next ground uh, group stages. And that brings us to the to, brings us to the end of news tonight. Thank you for watching. John Enopori has been on sign language, and I am Edward Rukidi Kijanangoma, wishing you a blessed evening on behalf of the entire news crew tonight. Bye bye.